thing. Okay. So welcome everybody here uh, in physical and virtually uh, at home or wherever you are. Uh, we are opening the new semester, the second semester, with a new series of uh, talks, very international, and um, and we're happy that everybody is joining us. And today we are hosting uh, Dr. Gioianto Rao from Likoping University in Sweden. Um, I will say some words about uh, joy and then some words about administration and then we will go on. So um, about joy, uh, after graduating with a master from the University of uh, Ruki in India and another master from Eastern Washington University in the United States, Dr. Raut went to Texas A&M University where he obtained a PhD. Following this path, he continued uh, as a geoscientist at Schlumberger in Houston in the United States, and then an associate professor in Stockholm University and ESEP Calcutta in India. In 2011, he moved to Linkoping University in Sweden, where he currently holds a professor position. Dr. Raut's research interests uh, are within the broad realm of biogeochemistry. His research focuses on paleoclimate reconstruction, monsoon variability, and pollution issues. The research efforts are based on a multifacets approach, which includes intensive fieldwork followed by analysis of biomarkers, trace metals, stable isotopes, microbial assays, and rigorous data interpretation. One of the key interests of his key interest is the application of biomarkers in environmental research. His research takes him to different parts of the world, including aquifers, caves, forests, lakes, pit box, mangroves, and river margins, with current uh, projects uh, held in India, uh, considering coal and air pollution, arsenic problems, and skeletons and lake sediments, Nepal, carbon flux in rivers, Iran, climate, cultural links, Kenya, and South Africa, with paleoclimate reconstructions, and also in Lake Victoria, with the fortifications and China with mining pollution. Aside of uh, research, he is an associate editor for Applied Geochemistry. I owe you <laughs> the review. <laughs> Current pollution report, Frontiers in Ear Science Journals. So uh, today we're hosting him and he's going to talk about tracing the late Pleistocene landscape changes and climate culture revolution in Southern Iran. Before we start, I would like to inform that considering the regulations of this semester, so uh, we should be in class. All of, the, of you that you are now in the internet is fine, but you are missing the cookies that actually I brought. So we try to be as much as possible in class and whoever cannot attend it can be in Zoom, okay? Obviously the speaker. And I guess that you have better cookies than us. <laughs> so, now, Joy, the podium is yours. Thanks a lot, Nicholas. I hold you. I hope you don't hold me accountable for everything that you mentioned. <laughs> that I do this and I do that. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, thanks a lot for having me here today. And uh, it's a very informal session, as I see. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask questions and interrupt me if you need uh, any clarification or we can take them at the end of the, of the talk. Uh, also, I do not see everybody. So please, uh, if you raise hands and things like that, I hope somebody tells me what's going on because I can only see so much on this little screen in front of me. Uh, so I thought uh, I will talk to you a little bit about some work that we started doing in Iran, Southeast Iran, a few years back. And uh, I find that extremely exciting. And, um, and, and when this opportunity came up, I asked Nicholas, okay, what do you want me to talk about? And we decided on this theme of, about climate culture links. Uh, Nicholas and I, uh, we have been editing a special volume on, on monsoons uh, for frontiers. And um, so this was this work that we are doing is, of course, related to monsoons. So I thought, OK, why not? All right, so enough said. Let's uh, dig in. And um, the way I thought of 
arranged in this uh, short presentation was I was going to talk a little bit about Konar Sandal, uh, which is the heart and soul of Jiropt, which is a Bronze Age settlement. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the paradigms and puzzles of the site. And, uh, and we will then delve into some of the multi-proxy data that we have generated, at least for two of these sites uh, in Jasmurian and in Konar Sandal. And I will try to wind it up with some ongoing work. Uh, and that would be the last slide of my talk today. Uh, so uh, Konar Sandal, uh, this, is the, this is the heart and soul of this settlement in Jirupt. And I would like to bring your attention to some beautiful artifacts that have been dug up from this site. This is a Bronze Age settlement, an early Bronze Age settlement. So of course, you mean, it means you'll see a lot of bronze artifacts like this, uh, as shown over here, which is an oil lamp. I would like to draw your attention to these beautiful earthenwares and pottery that have been discovered from the site and look at the glazed work um, and, and the paintings. Uh, these are beautiful, uh, kept in the Tehran National Museum and in the Kerman Museum. You also find a lot of uh, jewelry. Uh, people were using glass beads. Uh, they were using silver and gold for making jewelry. And this clay cup caught my attention, kept in the Tehran National Museum which is a cartoon strip. If you, if you look around this clay mug, uh, you've got an ibex sitting over here and it's chewing on this tree. And as you move around the cup, you see that the size of the tree is decreasing. So that caught my attention. I said, wow, this is very interesting. And um, at this site, uh, what you find are two huge mounds which have been discovered, the North and the South Mound. And we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, also, what has been discovered are these steatite vessels. Uh, steatite is a very soft stone, uh, which is also called as soapstone. And this has been used for uh, making these beautiful carvings, which is very, very unique to the Jiroptis. And I will come to this, uh, the importance of these steatite vessels in a minute. Um, more highlights of this, uh, of this place. Uh, we did not know about Jiropt, uh, except that there is a modern city of Jiropt. But the fact that you actually had uh, ancient settlement going back to the early Bronze Age about five plus thousand years ago was completely unknown to us. It just happened by a coincidence that there was a massive flooding in the Halil River, which uh, runs right through Konar Sandal. And this river got flooded and it exposed a cemetery in Mehragar. And what followed the next few years was very unfortunate uh, because what, what, what happened was once this cemetery was exposed, uh, people came to know uh, about the, the, the literal treasure trove, uh, which was now exposed consisting of jewelry, consisting of the steatite vessels uh, like these and pottery and so forth. And basically what happened is the villagers in this area divided up this place into small plots. And they were actively digging to pull out the material from the, uh, from, from the site to sell it in the open black market. So <clears throat> uh, clandestine looting actually went on at the site for almost three years before a consignment uh, on its way to Europe was confiscated by the, by the Iranian government in, in Tehran. And one thing led to another, they wanted to find out what was the source of these artifacts which were being shipped to, um, to Europe. And everything then zeroed down to the symmetry and uh, 
And what happened next was at least good in the sense that people became aware, the government got involved. Of course, uh, there was a huge loss in the past three years uh, where all this uh, crazy uh, digging around that went along. But uh, things are, are good in the sense it's been controlled by the Iranian government. They are involved in the process. And uh, what I would like to bring to your attention is the fact that you have had several Bronze Age settlements spread in Iran. And uh, these bronze uh, settlement, Bronze Age settlements, uh, they were being excavated initially by the Americans and the, and the Italians. And later on, the French and the Germans uh, got involved uh, with the Iranian archaeologists in, uh, in, in doing these excavations in several locations all over in Iran. Excavations in, uh, in Konar Sandal started off in 2003, uh, particularly uh, having the, the Iranian archaeologists and the French archaeologists who were involved in this process. And basically in 2003, a whole issue of, uh, of this uh, noted uh, French journal Archaeologia was devoted to this beautiful artifacts and antiques uh, that were being dug up from this site. Since 2006, unfortunately, there has been no excavations, and this is partly because of the international embargo that has been imposed upon, uh, upon, upon Iran. And it's pretty much a nightmare to work in this place uh, because of all the logistical problems and so forth, uh, transferring of funds, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's not a fun place. The good news, I would say, is these sites are protected. Uh, I've just visited Kunar Sandal and a few others, and, and this place is guarded. And at least I would say that uh, what was happening before is, uh, is under control. So uh, what was Jerobt? Uh, as I said, this is uh, early to late Bronze Age settlement going back to more than 5,000 years ago or so. And this is the special volume in Archaeologia, uh, which was published by the French in 2003, uh, focusing upon some of these artifacts which have been recovered from the sites. And uh, here are the steatite vessels. So <clears throat> let's see um, some highlights and who comes first. And uh, we will not go into these controversies, but I just wanted to explain uh, or bring your attention uh, and the first thing is whether to call this a settlement or a civilization and uh, there are always two sides of the story and with the uh, without going into the details of it all I would say that Jeroft represents a very urban center which was quite advanced for its time and 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 you will see that uh, in the coming slides there is significant advancement in making of pottery, uh, in bronze appliances, uh, buildings, agriculture. Uh, so they are quite well ahead of their time. Uh, this is very interesting. These steatite vessels uh, were discovered in Sumer uh, to its west and even in the Indus Valley civilization uh, in Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro to its east. And uh, the provenance of these uh, steatite vessels has always been very interesting because uh, the carvings were unique. They are not native to what has been found in Sumer or in Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. So it was always a question mark, where are they coming from? And once they found the things in Jerobt, uh, you can almost put two together over here and think that probably these guys were also having trade links with people uh, several thousand kilometers to their west and to their east. So I think that is really neat. You also find uh, 
these clay tablets. And when we think about uh, early writing, we think that they probably started in Elam, in Mesopotamia. Uh, the clay tablets that have been discovered in, in Jerot, they have been dated, although uh, the dating is not great. And, uh, and there is a controversy about it. So some of the people do claim that this is pre-Elamic uh, script also. So based upon some of these things, uh, there, are, there are people who claim that Jerovt could have predated Mesopotamia. But again, I said, as I said, we are not going to go into these uh, minor details, but uh, let's put it this way, that this is a cultural center which was quite advanced for its time. Uh, people were having fairly urban lifestyle. They were still dependent upon agriculture and so forth. So let's take a look at the puzzle. Why are we so interested? What kind of intrigues us? Uh, we see that Jerovt declined about 2,500 year BC. And the reasons for why this happened is not well understood. Uh, the settlement kind of collapsed. And if you speak with our archaeologist friends, uh, they would say, well, you have probably had nomadic invasions. Uh, there was pestilence. Uh, there was weak succession. And I think all those reasons are valid. They could have happened. And uh, one way or the other, we cannot deny that these things did not happen or happened both ways. But what intrigues us is if you look at their graves, uh, these are ceremonial graves, uh, you find, uh, you look at the excavations that have been done. These are structures which are intact. They have not been damaged or things like that. So, a settlement or a society being exposed to violence, wars, invasions, and some things like that somehow does not gel. Um, that's my take on it. And, uh, and so we question ourselves as to what triggered the collapse. Why did people abandon these urban sites and, and move away? So some interesting things are happening in the neighborhood. And what we see is um, one of the earliest papers uh, that was speaking about climate culture links goes back to 1993 when Harvey Weiss, uh, he, he published a paper in science which was looking at uh, the decline in Mesopotamia and related that to climate change. Further east, uh, the, the decline in the Indus Valley civilization has always been a, a, a very mysterious issue. Uh, people have claimed, okay, the decline in Indus happened because of uh, Aryan invasion, nomadic attacks, and so forth. But when you look at uh, the, the things that have been excavated from Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, you find that this was a very, very peaceful society. Uh, you did not find uh, arms or anything that has been discovered over here. Um, and these, this was a very, very urban, well-developed society. Um, and more recent uh, papers that have come along, research that has come along, which looks at different types of uh, proxy records, such as isotopes and, and so forth, they indicate that there was a change in the monsoon pattern. Monsoon declined over in this part of the country, and it seems that the people uh, in Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro moved further east towards the Indo-Gangetic plain where there was still rainfall and the conditions were still suitable. Very detailed records from Oman and North Africa, which shows that there has been a change in the monsoons, uh, comes from uh, Dominic Clayton's work in QSR. Uh, very detailed records. Uh, and most recently, a very interesting rec record 
comes from uh, Ashri Sena's work in a cave uh, from Iraq. And here they show the decline in this area directly related to the decline in, in rainfall and climate that happened. Within Iran itself, there are very detailed lake records. Uh, for example, the work from Sharifi, and they look at the Lake Nior and how there has been documented changes of Holocene uh, climate uh, during, during this time in, in Iran. So all these things are telling that there is something definitely going on during this period, during the mid-Holocene, when things start to change in this part of the world. So our working hypothesis is that there is something going on. Here is Jirot. And here is uh, Mesopotamia with the city-states of Babylon, Ur, Susa. And here is Mohenjo-Daro. You're looking at almost 3,000 kilometers between this place. To invoke the idea of, uh, of large-scale nomadic invasions uh, of uh, weak succession and so forth, happening around the same time is, I would say, an oversimplification of the issue. And what we think is probably some changes that are going on. And these changes are happening over a wide and a large area. And this causes perhaps the decline that we see in Jirot not necessarily what our archaeologist friends are saying. So with that in mind, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the ITCZ. Uh, and here are some of these uh, well-noted uh, areas um, that has been discovered, excavated, uh, such as uh, Kunar Sandal, Sarasukta, and uh, if you see uh, during the pre-Holocene, this was the ITCZ. This is how it has been modeled based upon uh, proxy records. And um, this is the present IC IC ITCZ, uh, which is the intertropical convergence zones. And this plays a very important role in where and how much rainfall you would get. These Bronze Age settlements are sitting right at the periphery of our ITCZ during the pre-Holocene. And since, uh, and, and this is the present day ITCZ, which has shifted further south. And that's the reason that it's only the tip or the very southeast part of Iran today gets any monsoons. And most of this region is a desert. So what we started doing uh, is we started uh, looking at, uh, at sites, different sites in, in Southeast Iran where we could uh, retrieve uh, sediment cores. And one of the first sites that we tried out was the Jasperian Playa. Here we retrieved a five meter long core, which takes us all the way back to the last glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago. We then move slightly north. Uh, this is where Kunar Sandal is. And this is a peat deposit, uh, which we retrieved uh, from where we retrieved a two and a half meter long core. And this takes us to about 4,000 years or so. And we also retrieved a highland peat deposit from the Barez Mountains uh, when we come from Kerman. And the last site is Sere Sakta which is uh, seated right next to the Afghan border. Uh, unfortunately, I was not allowed to be part of this expedition because uh, our government does not allow uh, us to visit this part of this disturbed area in the country since it's lying smack uh, in the opium trade route. 
But um, this score was brought to us two years back when we had a workshop in our department and my Iranian colleagues, uh, they brought the sediment core for us to continue working on it, which we had planned for. So let's take a look at it, uh, what we have been doing. As I said, we retrieve sediment cores from different environments. And here what happens is we believe uh, we believe uh, in, in multi-proxy data to be generated. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We use different coring methods uh, to retrieve the, the, the sedimentary archives, uh, depending upon whether it's a peat or a hard lake deposit or so forth. So we don't put all the eggs in, in a single basket, but uh, by which I mean we rely on multi-proxy data. Different proxies have got different sensitivities. Um, some work better under certain circumstances. Uh, you may not have access to running all the different types of proxies and so forth. So what we try to do is a mishmash of physical, geochemical, and biological proxies. Uh, for example, we do grain size and magnetic susceptibility, which tells us about the erosional processes that have happened. We look at pollen counts, which tells us about the vegetation pattern. This is very important, but pollen, they tend to get destroyed in very dry environments. So it has got restrictions uh, where you can get good pollen to be preserved. We look at uh, metal data, trace metals, uh, eye tracks data, where we again do this to get an idea about erosional processes, about aeolian processes and so forth. We look at the mineralogy, which tells you about uh, presence of evaporite minerals, for example, which you can then directly relate to hot or wet climate. We also look at stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes, and that tells you about the sources. Um, we look at biomarkers. This is what I specialize uh, with my students, uh, and we do a lot of biomarker work in our lab, where we try to find the different organic matter source, tie that to temperature and so forth. Uh, you've got a whole suite of different compounds which you could run. And then, of course, we try to reconstruct the paleohydrology. Uh, and of course, as all of this cannot be done in one place, we've got multiple partners involved in these projects and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about some of the sites that we have been working on. Uh, we'll start with Jasmurian. And Jasmurian is a uh, ephemeral lake which means it's only during part of the year that you find any water in this lake. Otherwise, mostly it's very dry, a lot of evaporite minerals on the surface. Uh, the lake receives water <clears throat> uh, from two rivers. The Halil River comes uh, from the north. And if you remember, this is the one uh, which runs right through Konar Sandal and that when it got flooded, exposed the cemetery. Uh, the lake also gets some amount of water from the Bampur River. And uh, it's only during a short time of the year that you actually see some water in the lake. The location of this uh, site is that it's more influenced by the, uh, by the Mediterranean winter precipitation zone and uh, not so much of an influence of the Indian summer monsoon. The landscape is xeric landscape, uh, desert uh, veg veg vegetation, and the rock types are mostly sandstones, conglomerates, uh, marls, and breccias. Ali, who was a PhD student from Tehran University, worked uh, with me. Uh, and uh, he was investigating the, the Jasmorean site. And this was a paper that he published in 2019, uh, which uh, analyzes uh, some of the trends that he saw with his uh, physical and chemical proxies. This shows the age versus depth uh, correlation. 
and uh, which shows that the core, the base of the core is almost about 21,000 years or so, going to the last glacial maximum. And this is the present day. Uh, so it's a fairly uh, good age depth uh, correlation that we see um, and we are confident with the chronology. So this sedimentary archive is very interesting. It captures various uh, major events like uh, the Younger Dryas, the Holocene, the 8.2 and the 4.2 events and so forth. So these are all well captured in the sediment core, which I will show you. So when we get these cores, uh, this is one of the few times when the lake gets flooded. So I thought I'll add a picture of that too. <laughs> So once we get the cores, what we do is uh, we quickly photograph them, slice it and dice it, and we start looking at the different proxies, uh, starting with simple things like grain size analysis, uh, looking at organic matter content, and you can see the squiggly lines and so forth. I would like to draw your attention to the mineralogy where we did the XRD in selected sample intervals. And what we find is the presence of certain minerals which are unique for evaporites. Evaporites only happen during very dry and warm conditions. So plugging on, uh, if we start to look at the base of the core, what we see is uh, that it's very fine grain sediments with um, with very low magnetic susceptibility, representing mostly Aeolian conditions uh, as you move from about 21,000 years to about 14,000 years. This is also a very cold period. Uh, and, and then we start to see more fluvial inputs popping up around 14,000 years, um, followed by a very, very dry period when we also start to see more of the evaporite minerals popping up. As we move further, uh, we get a very, very wet, a fairly long time period. And I would like to draw your attention. This, this is the start of the Holocene. And the start of the Holocene, we received the highest amount of insulation in the last 20,000 years. And this coincides with huge precipitation that has been recorded worldwide. Uh, fast forward ourselves, we start to see uh, around 5,000 years ago, fairly wet conditions. Uh, this is when Giroft rises, and then by the 4.2 event, when things become uh, quite unpleasant in terms of being very dry, a steep decline in your precipitation, we start to see also the decline of, um, of Giraud. So how do these records uh, coincide with other global records? What I've done is I have plotted the solar insulation record and uh, very well established records from the ice cores uh, from, this is from Lake Muir, which is in Iran. And then also the Dongi Cave in, in China, Kump in Oman and so forth. And what we see is wherever we are thinking that we had very warm periods or very wet periods, they do coincide with what some of these other very well established global records are showing in terms of very warm and dry conditions. So this gives us confidence that Jesmarian is a very, very promising archive, which captures a lot of these events, these global events. And what we see is a repeated flip-flop of very warm and dry conditions over the last 20,000 years or so. All right, uh, we will switch to the second site, uh, site which is uh, the Riachi. And this is smack lying in Kunar Sandal. 
and our idea was to reconstruct the hydroclimatic conditions uh, based upon the pollen work and uh, establish the human and environmental interactions that has been going on. So Kunar Sandal, as I said, is, uh, is a very urban settlement. You can find these large dwellings. Um, and we retrieved our core right in between these two large mounds, the northern and the southern mounds. And uh, around this place, what we find are these dwellings, which have been dug up uh, very intact, uh, where it shows uh, houses, uh, where there is a cooking corner, there is place for doing the metallurgy and so forth, um, storing their grain and so forth. So it's, it's very well structured um, urban settlements that you find over here. Carolina, one of my master students, she was interested in doing the pollen work in this core and um, with help from our uh, colleagues from France, uh, the pollen work started off and what we see and that the base of our core goes to about 3,900 years uh, to be very, very specific. Now, if you remember what I said earlier is that our uh, Girot declines about 4 point, around 4,200 years ago. So we just kind just of missed out on uh, capturing the, the peak or the decline of, uh, of Girot, but just caught what was happening just after the decline, which is from 3,900 years onwards and the core goes all the way up to the Mongol invasion. Uh, the current uh, vegetation pattern has been uh, discussed in detail by Mashkur and, and Morteza, uh, who are researchers uh, at Marseille University. And what we primarily find for this area in Konar Sandal uh, is that these are herbaceous uh, semi-woody plants thriving in salty swamps and so forth. What was done in this core was we looked at detail, uh, the different pollen uh, that we could retrieve. And uh, this helps us to establish uh, what was the vegetation uh, that was there? Uh, what was the land use? Uh, could we tie it up with cultural things and so forth? So that was the aim. And uh, when we look at the pollen count, what we find is that uh, the Amaranthaceae is more abundant than Artemisia and Poesi. Poesi represents grass and uh, cereals whereas Artemisia is a very, a very good indicator of dry conditions. Only when you have uh, very dry periods, these plants thrive. So under dry conditions, what we find are desert shrubs. Uh, we find a lot of weeds, particularly rumex and uh, propsopsis. I have a hard time pronouncing these words, um, but yeah. And under wet conditions, what we find is a lot of salix and tamarix. Tamarix is very important. Uh, we find this uh, widely used in almost all these Bronze Age settlements, whether it's in, in, in Indus or whether it's in Mesopotamia or China, they're all using uh, tamarix for um, for building, for, for firewood, and so forth. Wet conditions also indicate presence of cereal, uh, although these are not so well preserved at times, but we do find presence of various cereals. Uh, we find presence of uh, things like belonging to, to pistachio and olive. Probably these were wild varieties uh, which prevailed back then. And of course, there is presence of this particular um, particular pollen, which is unique to pastoralism, 
because the conditions are too dry and agriculture does not prevail. And uh, it's just wild uh, plants. And one of them is this guy. You also find a lot of charcoal, uh, particularly during the peaking uh, of, 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 of the settlement when a lot of people are living there using charcoal and we find very high charcoal counts. So when we put all the pollen, we get this crazy diagrams, but I will just try to make things a little bit simpler for you. Uh, just around 3,900 years or so, we see pastoralism uh, to be quite abundant. Um, there is also some cereal cultivation, which is going along, which kind of falls off as we hit a very, very dry period around 2,900 years or so. Uh, following that, as we hit more wet conditions, uh, uh, we start to see more cultivation. This also coincides with uh, the Iranian, uh, the, the Persian Empire and so forth, uh, which you'll see in a minute, and uh, which coincides with more uh, wet conditions, which helps with agriculture and so forth. What Ali has done is he has, we are putting together this, uh, this paper where we have put all these different biomarker information which shows when it's dry, when it's wet. We have also put a lot of uh, other uh, proxies such as the elemental ratios and so forth. And in this short core, uh, what we see is uh, that in the last 4,000 years, again, there has been flip-flop of warm and dry conditions, which match very well with some of these other very well-established records, whether it's from, from Turkey, the Lake Ban core, or uh, Lake Saribar in, in Persia and so forth. I would like to draw your attention uh, to these two arrows over here, and uh, this refers to around 2,500 years ago when the Achaemenids uh, were in power. And if you look at the territorial uh, expansion during Darius's rule, you find that this was the largest extent of the Persian Empire during, during the Achaemenids. And later on, around 1500 years ago or so, the Sassanids come into power. And again, you find a fairly large uh, territorial extent, which continued all the way until the seventh century, the Sassanids. And both these periods are wet periods. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that climate helped things to flourish, and that's the main reason that you had huge empires, but what I'm trying to draw your attention to is, yes, these are powerful kings. Uh, they had a huge army and everything at their, at their control and, and, and so forth. But so was it with the population that they were supported in terms of favorable climate where they could do their agriculture and so forth. So it's very intriguing, I thought, that you actually see this match. So the inference we draw is that there have been repeated arid conditions, uh, which, uh, which caused the, the decline in agriculture to happen in both these sites that we see. We also see that there are milder periods. Uh, and during this milder conditions, what we see is there's a, there's a decline in Artemisia. And uh, instead, what we start to see is a more serial type of pollen uh, being recorded over here. We also find a lot of charcoal, which is an indication that uh, there was human inhabitation, uh, probably there was agriculture and they were doing the burn and slash practice perhaps, who knows. The important thing is that during these milder periods, the communities thrive and this you see all the way happening to the Persian and the Islamic periods. So what we conclude 
from this is that uh, these physical, geochemical, and biological proxies, they show a strong imprint of climate uh, derived signals which influenced this region. We see very dry versus wet conditions, which is kind of flip flopped. And uh, this has affected the cultural changes that we see. And overall, it shows the aspect of human resilience over here. When it's very dry, it's hard to do agriculture, people switch to pastoralism. But when conditions are favorable, when there is enough rainfall, people again repopulate the same places that they had abandoned and the start their agriculture, they resettle these places. So human race is very, very resilient. Um, and what I would say that these sites are fantastic and uh, we still need to investigate some of these things to establish this effect of, of climate which has been going on. I would end with these last two or three slides. And, um, and this is the work that we have started in Sarasota. Um, this is the eye tracks data provided by our colleagues from Potsdam. And uh, what we see is um, the elemental ratios which have been plotted and they separate the, the sediment core into clusters. Uh, and these clusters coincide with very dry conditions, uh, conditions when you had a lot of uh, uh, clay minerals, which would represent flooding and so forth. So we are still trying to interpret the eye track status. Uh, we are also looking at very diagnostic markers like lignans and alkanes and so forth. And I'll show that in a minute. Uh, and we are, yeah, we are doing a lot of biomarker work. And uh, this is the data that was just generated by my students last week, which shows the lignin distribution. And uh, lignins are compounds that you find in higher plants and grasses. And you can basically divide the plant kingdom into angiosperms and gymnosperms, which are woody, non-woody, and, uh, and, and grasses. And if you look at the Holocene, this is where uh, the action is where Sahara Sutta really takes off and we start to see a rise in the, in the, in, in, in the syringes, which are angiosperms and also the poesia, which are basically cereal-like or grass-like uh, compounds uh, preserved in, 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 our, in our lignin signature. What also excites us, we plotted the acid aldehyde ratios in, in, these, uh, in these records. And what we find is it coincides with arable soils and grasslands just when the Saris of the peaked, which shows that this was a, a center where there was active cultivation going along. One thing which really caught my attention was this paper that came out in 2019, which shows the migration of people uh, migrate because it has always uh, been uh, a source of contention. Where did, where, how did people come to Western Europe? Uh, is it just from people who moved from, from, from East Africa or there were other migration patterns also happening? And uh, what we see is that in this area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, there are a group of people who are actually going in both directions. And this uh, comes from the ancient DNA work, uh, which has been done in, in bones collected from, from, from these different sites to show that a large number of these uh, people were coming from this single area, going all the way to Western Europe and even to India. So this is where we are kind of headed, uh, getting access to bones from early Bronze Age settlements is very tough from, from, from Iran. 
uh, part of it is the is the quality of the material and uh, fortunately our colleagues in France who have been involved in a lot of these excavations uh, they are interested in working with us and uh, we are currently discussing with people in Uppsala University to go ahead with the ancient DNA work. Finally, I would like to thank all my colleagues in Iran, in Tehran University, INS, and Istan Balochistan University who have been a part of this work. Our folks in Max Planck, Hiena, and Potsdam, uh, they have been helping us with a lot of the analysis. Uh, in France, uh, you've got the Marseille University and the Natural History Museum in Paris. Uh, we also have got people from the US involved, uh, from Florida and Notre Dame. Uh, and we are now thinking of uh, involving people in Uppsala for helping us with the ancient DNA work. Uh, and funding for this study has been provided by the Swedish Research Council. So that brings me to the end of this talk today. Probably I've gone over time. <laughs> I'm sorry about it. Uh, and that leads us to some questions, which I would be happy to answer. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Joy. It was really enlightening, uh, especially for us in Israel, that there is no way in the world probably that soon we're going to be in Iran. <laughs> now we're in the list of acknowledgments over there. <laughs> but at least we are seeing something which, uh, in a way, it's similar to us, but thousands thousands of kilometers apart unfortunately yeah. so i open i open the um, the podium for questions um uh, from here and from the audience online i don't see all of you so just jump in i start with yeah. the online can i go ahead Andy. yes um first of all thank you very much it was lightning and it's the first time that i hear about research in Iran, and I found it uh, very fascinating. Um, second of all, I can see the proximity of the research area to the Arab Arabian Sea. And as far as I know, um, the record of the sediment in the Arabian Sea is a lake-like um, record because it's a close sea. I wanted to ask if there is any work that continues your work that made on cores of, on marine cores from the Arabian Sea, or it's just a terrestrial um, coring program. Uh, ours is completely a terrestrial <laughs> coring program, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, to to core in the Arabian Sea is 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 a challenge in itself, and of course there has been IODP uh, cores from the Arabian Sea, particularly in the mouth of the Indus, uh, which was which was targeted in the IODP uh, leg. Uh, we have not ventured uh, that site as yet, uh, nor have we worked with. Uh, with the Indus Valley civilization. So, but yeah, someday. <laughs> uh, just now, all of our work is focused on land itself and, and not in the open ocean. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. More, questions? More questions from online. Again, I don't see all of you, so just jump in and ask the question. Okay, well, you are thinking on questions, there are questions here. Um, come over to ask the question here. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so my question is like, uh, when you are generating uh, like- Nico? Sorry. Yeah, do you want to ask a question, Ahmad? Sorry, Just I- I did not follow. Somebody was asking a question and then it broke off. Online, you yeah. people online, just wait, there is a question ongoing. So, okay, uh, sorry. So, my question is like, uh, when you are like generating a climatic record, 
uh so how do you like distangle all the uh, human activities uh from your record so let's say you are working in like mid holocene and late holocene mm -hmm. so let's say suppose you your proxy data indicates it's a drought condition but actually it is people using that water for irrigation or agriculture purposes mm -hmm. so how do you like you know delineate those two factors i think this is a very valid question and and this always bothers us uh, because we do not have any direct evidence all we have evidence for for example is a wet or a dry condition and we are saying so based upon say the isotope record or the prox or say the pollen record and so forth so the more records we have the stronger the arguments become in terms of human the human angle that you would like to tease out from your data this does this period coincide with active uh, things like agriculture and all those things in that case hopefully your record if the pollen preservation is very good then you would actually see cereals and things like that preserved in your pollen record. And if that coincides with, for example, your GDGT records, which tells us about the temperature or your oxygen isotopes, which again tells us about the, the monsoons and things like that, we kind of tie these things together, okay? It's, a more, it's more monsoons, wet conditions, more agriculture and that's why people are probably probably thriving because they can grow a lot of things and that is proved based upon the pollen record. So all these things need to fall in place before you start to make any, 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 any strong uh, arguments for it that this is what most likely happened. So I think these are these are interesting aspects. We can never, never, ever be 100% sure. It's just that uh, these are proxy records that you're going by. The question is how sensitive is your proxy? And uh, can we still make some sense by using multi-proxy multi data where you bring in information from different things to show the climate culture links. And that's all that we are trying to attempt in our, in our work. Okay, thank you very much. More questions here, no? Uh, more questions online? Can you go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Professor, I'm, yeah, I'm interested to know, does your data, can we infer any uh, difference of severeness of dryness during younger dryers and the LGN from your data? Uh, this is something that we have not gone to that extent in the sense saying that, okay, this is extremely dry. Uh, this, this is something that we would like to attempt further. And one of the things that we would like to do is to use the GDGTs, uh, which are temperature-driven proxies. And these are lipids, which are produced by soil bacteria and are fairly well preserved. And uh, we have done GDGTs in stalagmites and so forth. We have not done it for this site. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we would like to do because that tells us how what was the possible temperature uh, back then in time? Uh, and that you can further, again, cross verify with the oxygen isotopes, which tells us uh, what could have been the tentative conditions uh, in terms of precipitation, in terms of uh, temperatures. Um, so we have not gone to those finer details of what exactly it was during the younger dryers over there or the 4.2 event or the bowling alley or whatever. Uh, so no, we haven't done that as yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. More questions? 
Okay, I have just a small comment. Um, mm -hmm. One of the slides that you, one of the last slides, you are correlating the data with also the Dead Sea, mm -hmm. which is interesting. It probably it will be <laughs> tackling. <laughs> Political, uh, but in any case, you are you are you are marking over there the Lisan, and I think just to mention that that's a mistake because the Lisan ended at um, seventeen thousand years, and you are talking four thousand onwards. Mm -hmm. So basically, there is no any more Lisan. It's the Dead Sea. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think I I have to. I have to look at that core that that last slide. We are still working on that. And I will definitely keep this comment of yours in mind. Um, no problem. Basically, there is no Lisan after 70,000 years. And, mm -hmm. and eventually, take care if this is a, a wet, because overall it was dry. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. like flash floods. So you need to mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. because you saw you mark wet periods. But that yeah, yeah. It, all, all over it was wet periods that we have marked. I think yeah. it's, uh, yeah, yeah. We can we can have a discussion if you want. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much, Joy. And uh, if you wish to stay connected with us, I will um, give you the information for the next. Um, I will put you in the list of uh, email for sure. our sure. seminar series. Sure, I would like to attend some of them <laughs> if I can. <laughs> you have the thank you also for yeah. our head of department over there in the chat. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You so much. And Thank everybody, you very much. see you next week. Bye bye. All right. Take care. Bye bye.